Okay, great. Thanks for having me to give this short talk today. Um, I wanted to briefly go over where we are at uh, in terms of figuring out how this virus got from an ancestral bat uh, strain of SARS-related virus to COVID-19. So it's really an open question right now, whether it's natural or research related. And there's so many ways it could have traveled from a bat virus, maybe decades to centuries ago in, in transforming into COVID-19. And so uh, with natural origins, there are at least two different pathways, one of which is the most popular one, uh, intermediate host. So not going direct from bats to humans, but through a host that's more similar to humans. And we are very well aware of the interfaces where humans can interact with these animals at farms, markets, uh, trafficking, habitat invasion. Uh, the other one is through direct contact from bats to humans. So from a person who is exposed to bats on a quite regular basis, something like uh, a person who is a miner, so exposed to millions of bats, or a villager who lives really close to uh, bat caves. There's evidence of that, but it's considered quite rare in contrast to intermediate host uh, hypothesis. For research related, there are also two different pathways. So one is also uh, animal directly to human. So in this case, we know that there were scientists who were tasked with sampling thousands, tens of thousands of animals and also thousands of people living at this natural origin interface. So they were sampling animals from markets as well as people at markets. They were tracing people from clinics uh, who had unresolved pneumonia. They were also sampling tens of thousands of bats uh, in places that they suspected had uh, dangerous animal pathogens. So this is risky work and can also result in a transmission. Uh, so the more uh, I guess well-known research-related hypothesis involves a research accident in the lab. And again, this can involve a range of uh, different processes or activities, for example, growing or culturing or passaging, uh, serial passaging viruses and cell lines, a whole range of different cell lines and animal models in the lab, uh, genetic engineering, maybe just a minor modification or maybe a chimera, uh, infection assays where you're testing whether the virus can infect and grow well in different cell types or animal models. So there are many ways uh, for both research and natural origin pathways to result in a pandemic, unfortunately. So I have about 15 minutes to talk and I'll focus on the five most important questions. So one is how did the virus adapt to human beings? Where's the proximal animal source? Uh, was the SARS-2-like virus likely to naturally emerge in Wuhan? What kind of research was conducted using SARS archives? Uh, how much of the research ongoing in Wuhan do we know about? So the first thing is, I know that there's some contention about whether the virus adapted to humans or not in the first few months. But I'd say that by now there's, there's quite a wide consensus across different groups of people, independent groups of people, who all say that at the beginning of this pandemic, this virus already possessed adequate affinity, uh, was well adapted to human transmission, this is a WHO study. Uh, even the proximal origins paper said that if the virus had pre-adapted another animal species or if the adaptive process had occurred in humans, there are different outcomes. But they were agreed that this virus had already adapted to humans. So there's wide uh, consensus on this idea that the virus was good to go in the beginning. So the question is, how did that happen? Uh, there are three different ways. So one is that the virus had pre-adapted in non-human animal, likely something that's very similar to humans. So that once it jumped over, it only needed a few tweaks or a few mutations. This can happen naturally or in a research-related way. And I'll use these color codings throughout the slides. Uh, naturally is green, research-related is blue. So uh, the second one, which is more likely, uh, according to some experts, is that it spilled over many months ago before detection in Wuhan in December. So again, this can happen in a natural or research-related way. We don't know. Uh, so in this case, the virus will have pre-circulated picking up adaptations that make it better at transmitting and infecting humans for months. Uh, and the last one, which is the most controversial, is that a natural or genetically modified virus could have been worked with in the lab and ended up ad adapting to infect human cells or humanized animal models in the lab better, uh, resulting in a uh, lab accident, unfortunately. So I hope that from this you can tell why it's so difficult to distinguish between a natural or genetically modified or research-related uh, virus genome. So if you just look at the genome alone, it can be consistent with natural evolution, but it's difficult for you to know whether it was you know, pre-adapted in the an animal and then spilled over in a research-related way, or whether it's natural, but it's spilled over many months ago, maybe through a uh, sampling expedition. So there are many ways that a natural virus can still spill over in a research-related way.
even a genetically modified virus may not be possible to distinguish from the genome alone. So this is an ongoing challenge for top scientists even, is that you can't just look at the genome and say, did this ever pass through a lab or cell culture in the lab? So the question for pre-circulation is, when did the outbreak begin? And we know that from the earliest data describing the patients uh, that were detected in Wuhan in December, that we were just seeing the tip of the iceberg. So if you look at these 25 to 49 year olds that were diagnosed as COVID patients, more than a third were in the ICU. So imagine if we see those numbers today, it's, it's not reasonable. So these people were the most severe of the severe cases. They were seeing the tip of an iceberg. Uh, unfortunately, the China WHO study did not succeed in identifying any cases before December 2019. So they, they found like something like close to 80,000 patients who they thought could be potentially COVID, but they only tested 90 of them in January of this year. So by that time, there was no more antibodies left. Uh, so that resulted in a net zero of new early cases detected. So in this case, all we have is unfortunately the biased data that was uh, detected in December. So data that they uh, picked based on links to markets. So even back then, they showed that the earliest cases actually had no exposure to the seafood market. Uh, but they still use this criteria as shown in the WHO report where they went specifically to find patients at markets or with links to markets. And so where we are at 1.5 years later is that surprisingly, China has not reported testing blood samples banked in uh, 2019, not even in like September or November 2019. Uh, they also have not apparently contact traced the earliest cases. So they didn't go and collect you know, blood samples from uh, their families or co-workers to see where was the initial exposure. So all that work should have been done like in the first months of the pandemic because that's when you can actually detect antibodies. So now two years later, it's just impossible. Uh, and again, just looking at the data that's available, if you look at the distribution of uh, the elderly in Wuhan, this is how it maps. So the densest population is here in the center of the city, which makes total sense. There are a lot of uh, care homes here. And if you look at how this, uh, pandemic started, the mapping of the earliest cases, according to uh, the WHO and China joint report, it maps almost exactly to where the oldest and most densest part of the population is. And so it really ties into this picture that what we saw in December 2019 was just like the most severe cases. And it makes complete sense that these are occurring in the places where most elderly people live in the city. So. The next question is, where is the proximal animal source? So in May of last year, we were finally told that no animals from the market were positive for SARS-2 infection. And actually, the Chinese authorities had known by the end of January 2020 that there were no animals from the market that were positive for SARS-2 infection. They told the OIE in private, and they spent the next few months trying to find, trying to find a source of an of a animal source of the virus, and they couldn't find anything. By May, the Chinese CDC director came out and told everyone, it looks like the market was a victim. The virus had existed long before. So by a year later, March 2021, they finally came out with this uh, report with the WHO saying that they had tested 80,000 uh, animal samples. More than half were wild animal species. So 41,000-ish were from, uh, you know, civets, raccoon dogs, the kind of wildlife samples. So not, not just chicken and pork. Uh, they collected these from 31 provinces between 2018 and 2020. No positive result was reported for any of these samples. Uh, and we heard from the Wall Street Journal later that they had talked to farmers in South China who apparently had their farms bought and, and shut down in early 2020 and without testing. So they had not been tested to see whether their farm, the one that was supplying Wuhan with uh, wild animal species, had had been the source of COVID-19. So then again, it's, it's just, uh, such a curiosity is that it, it's in the national interest of a country to find the source of a killer virus. So the first thing they should have done really is to check all the upstream and downstream suppliers to see whether that is the source and, and to definitively shut it down. So in, in light of all of these activities and, and investigations, there's still zero direct evidence today that points to proximal animal origin. So no positive animal samples uh, there is a pathway potentially, but there's no evidence for it. So uh, I know that a lot of people cite a recent report in scientific reports uh, that talks about animal cells in Wuhan across 17 stores in Wuhan that sold uh, wild animals. And I'd say that there is a pathway for, for a virus to naturally emerge in Wuhan, 
but the numbers are not as robust as what you would see in South China. So uh, remember that in the SARS-1 epidemic, once they had pegged the civet as an intermediate host, they had to slaughter like 10,000 civets in, in that proximity of Guangzhou. Uh, but here, if you look at the numbers from this paper, you look at civets, for example, on average, they saw about 11 civets per month in 29 months uh, across 17 stores being sold with a standard deviation of eight. So this means that sometimes there might have been only one or two civets being sold per month across 17 stores. So this uh, data, it would be great if you could see the actual numbers, the actual distribution over time. I was told by the authors that in the winter, the sales are really low. So like November, there's very few uh, wild animals being sold. And uh, again, it's just not comparable to the much more uh, robust sale of wild species in South China, where eating wild species is more of a cultural uh, trend. So is the market the source of the pandemic? Uh, we know that many of the early patients, uh, including the first patient, had no exposure to the market. In fact, the first patient, the market that he's been linked to popularly, is actually an RT mart. So it's a Costco equivalent uh, that was on the side of the river in the district where the Wuhan Institute of Virology was located. So there's some confusion around this data. Um, and we know also that another early variant of the virus, only two mutations different, so not enough to suggest a separate spillover event, was circulating in other places. And Dr. Jesse Bloom, he had this really insightful figure in his uh, paper, which is now published in Molecular Biology and Evolution, where if you map the uh, genome sequences of the virus collected from the Huanan seafood market, was this everywhere else? So data that had been deleted and restored by him, uh, a patient who had traveled from Wuhan to Guangdong, other Wuhan sequences, other parts of China, outside of China, you can see that this early variant, most similar to the bad viruses rel related to SARS-2, was not found at, this, at the market. So it's possible that maybe they just didn't detect it, maybe it's missing, but it's also possible that the market was just a super spreader event that happened later in the outbreak. So in that sense, a hypothesis of multiple spillovers and multiple markets, it seems non-parsimonious, an absence of direct evidence for zoonosis in even a single market. So the next question is, was a SARS-2-like virus likely to naturally emerge in Wuhan? And the answer is no, it was not likely. And even the uh, PI, no. Dr. Oh, yes? And now, can you conclude yeah. four minutes around? Yep. More or less? Yep. yep. So Xi uh, Zhengli, she found that zero out of 240 random blood donors in Wuhan had antibodies against SARS. They only found six people in Yunnan uh, living near the bad case, but they found SARS viruses that had antibodies. And they used the word rare spillover when they described this in uh, before the pandemic. So the people who've been infected as well, they, they stayed really close to the county. They didn't leave in the year before sampling them. Only one had traveled outside the province. So uh, was it likely to emerge in Wuhan? So the zoonotic origin of SARS-1 was rapidly confirmed. Within two months of isolating the virus, they already found widespread circulation in the animal trading community. So I can't go through these in detail, but they found that people who traded in civets, primarily, 73% of them tested positive for SARS antibodies, even though they had not been diagnosed clinically with SARS. So it spoke to widespread circulation exposure of uh, animal traders to SARS-2, to SARS-1 at the time. But there was no such evidence for SARS-2. Uh, sim similarly, thousands of bats, maybe tens of thousands of bats in Uhupe have been sampled over the years, but none were reported to carry SARS-R coughs that could utilize ACE2. All of SARS-2's closest relatives are still from Yunnan, in this province here, in South China. So, in summary for this question, Wuhan is the central hub in China. There's a way for the virus to get through animals to uh, Wuhan, but it had not been pegged as a likely site of a novel SARS virus spillover. So getting to the, the research that was conducted in SARS uh, research at Wuhan, um, we know that from the Equal Health Alliance's grants that they were characterizing high spillover risk SARS in southern China. So they were deliberately collecting tens of thousands of samples from South China, bringing it back up to Wuhan. Uh, they were checking people as well uh, and working local clinics and CDCs to collect these samples. Once in the lab, they would test the ability of novel spikes using pseudoviruses or chimerics or synthetic uh, viruses to infect different human cells or human ACE2 expressing cells. 
as well as animal models such as humanized mice and civets. So we know that a whole range of uh, research activities was happening. They didn't have to just rely on naturally isolated viruses. They could just build it from scratch as long as they had a genome or a spike sequence. We know from a recently FOIA document that these are unpredictable. So when you look at these uh, data, it shows that some of these novel chimeric viruses could grow up to about 10,000 times better than the parent virus that they had uh, isolated or synthesized in the lab. And in 2018, the scientists expressed that this was a valuable model to continue to access uh, novel pathogens. They proposed to do similar experiments with MERS viruses. So we now know that the WIV was working with nine closest relatives to SARS-2 when the virus was first detected in December, yet this information was not shared on day one. It took more than a year for sleuths and internet uh, analysts to collect all of this information, put it together that this had been collected from Mo Chiang Mai, where six people had sickened with a mysterious pneumonia suspected to be caused by a bad virus with a 50% mortality rate. So this information, again, it was not shared on day one. We also know from literature that all of the viruses described by the WIV so far have been collected pre-2016. This doesn't mean that suddenly they stopped uh, collecting viruses. It just means there's a natural lag in publication. So we don't know what they had found after this time. So that's, a, that's just a reality. And they had a very strict confidentiality protocol described by the Washington Post in a recent story. They also took their virus database offline and has not been made available since to help scientists globally understand the novel coronavirus. So in summary, we have no dispositive evidence for either natural or lab origin. These answers are needed before we can have a very confident estimate of which scenario is more likely. So I'd just like to acknowledge the organizers, uh, all the internet and independent analysts who contributed to this knowledge, as well as all the investigative journalists and scientists and experts who have also analyzed the data. Thank you.